Okay, good morning, everyone. Welcome to BC 308, our uh, class studying Revelation and Daniel. We've covered Daniel. We are going through Revelation uh, chapter by chapter. Let's take a moment, please, to pray together, and then we'll get started. Could um, somebody please pray with us, and then we will start. Could somebody pray with the class, please? Okay, let's pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, thank you again for another moment. Thank you for another time to learn. Thank you for all you've been doing thus far how you, Lord, built us up in your word through the teachings, Lord, and how much revelation and insight we have gained so far in all the classes. We thank you, Lord, for yet another class. And we pray, Lord, for your son, who is going to instruct us, who is going to guide us, and who is going to explain things. And Lord, you spoke many, many years ago. We pray by the Spirit of God, may we all be refreshed, May we all gain deep insights. May we understand, Lord, the prophecies that Lord, you have kept for us, Lord, to be prepared and to be aware of the seasons and times we live in and be prepared, to, Lord, for your coming. We pray, Father, that this time we spend will be worthwhile and all the glory will be yours in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for being on the class today. So we are in Revelation chapter 6. We are um, we paused towards the um, second part of chapter 6. Just to do a quick refresher. Um, Revelation 1, John has the vision of the Lord at that time. Revelations, Revelation chapters 2 and 3 are the message of the Lord to seven churches. Sean records that. Revelation 4 verse 1 onwards, the Lord tells John, I will show you things that are yet to come. So Revelation 4 1 is looking way, uh, 4 1 onwards is looking way into the future. Revelation chapter 4 and 5, we saw uh, this throne room, what's happening in the throne room. And we said that uh, this is a scene of the throne room, most likely right after the rapture of the church. And uh, we are seeing the elders with their rewards, their robe of righteousness, their crowns, their thrones, the 24 elders. We see uh, angels, thousands upon thousands, standing before the throne, worshiping. And we also see very something very important that at that moment, but John is seeing out in the future, that's the moment that Jesus, the Lamb of God, portrayed there in chapter 5 as the Lamb of God, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of the offspring of David. He comes and he takes the scroll from the Father's hand to open the seals uh, on the scroll, indicating that that's the time all the prophecies are going to start being fulfilled. So really, it's it's a vision that's saying, okay, now these things are going to start happening. Chapter 6, verse 1 onwards is, we come back to earth and say, okay, this is what's happening on earth. Chapter 6, we see the first four seals, there are, it's portrayed by these, Horses coming on the coming. You know, John is seeing horses now. Uh, we have to un understand these as prophetic imagery. Uh, it's not literal horses, but it's signifying entrance of something that comes with strength and speed. So the first horse, there's this rider on the horse, a uh, white horse. He's got a crown. He's got authority. He's going to make war. He's gaining influence. So we call him the Antichrist because he's not the real Christ. He comes like the Christ. The real Christ also comes riding on a white horse. But here's 
somebody else coming on a white horse. He's making war and he's gaining influence. And this is the beginning of the tribulation, the seven year period. And then we see, you know, uh, uh, Revelation 6 5, the, um, sorry, there's the uh, uh, red horse, uh, the black horse, and a pale horse, each one signifying something happening on the earth that is destroying people. There is war, there is famine, there is death, uh, just spreading across the earth. Then uh, the fifth seal, Revelation 6 verse 9, uh, we saw that there were many who were martyred for their faith in Christ. This is right in the beginning of the tribulation. So this is after the rapture of the church, uh, and then uh, the Antichrist has come on the scene. All these destructions are beginning to happen. Souls are being, people are being killed for the testimony of the Lord. So that's where we stopped. And we're going to pick up in Revelation chapter 6, verse 12 onwards. So, the, so uh, I forgot to mention. So the, there are three sets of seven judgments first are seven seals then there are seven trumpets and then there are seven bowls each signifying something happening there are um, uh, you know one or two uh, places where there would be silence and so on but generally every seal every trumpet every bowl is telling us something, some judgment happening here or not, something happening. So we're looking through the first set of seven judgments, seven seals. We are now in Revelation 6 and verse 12 on the sixth seal. Um, Avni? Pastor, you just said that in the beginning of, in 6 9, in the beginning of tribulation, people mm -hmm. will be martyred for the faith. So if the church is raptured, then who are these people who are then martyred for their faith? Uh, that's what I'm wondering. Mm -hmm. So, see, there will be many people who come to faith throughout the tribulation. So you can imagine a lot of people today are hearing the gospel. Uh, they laugh at us. Oh, you know, they, they think we are foolish people, you know, to believe the Bible and uh, you know, we are sharing the gospel with them. They laugh at us. They refuse to believe. But when the rapture happens, it is going to shock the whole world. The rapture is not a small thing. Just imagine when the Lord Jesus comes to take the church away. We're going to have millions of people from just about every city on the earth disappear. What do you, what's, you know, what you begin to make can imagine, you know, what's going to happen to all the people who, who, who have heard the gospel, but they laughed at us. They refused to believe at that time. They're probably going to go look for their Bible or they're going to, you know, read the things we sent to them, whatever. And they're going to believe, but it's going to be very difficult during the seven years of tribulation. The first three and a half years is difficult the second three and a half years will be even worse. So we, we will see as we journey through, through the book of Revelation that there are many people who are going to believe and are going to die for their faith during the tribulation. So, Pastor, there's a very, <laughs> very curious question here. From mm -hmm. Those who have believed have been raptured. Mm -hmm. Bible, uh, you know, when we read the scriptures, we see that those who have been martyred have a better place or they have more greater rewards. So uh, now when they are being martyred during the tribulation, so, uh, you know, their, uh, you know, their reward will be greater. And like I'm thinking uh, mm -hmm. right now in that way, for those who have lived a long life of faith, went through ups and downs, everything, they have persevered through the faith. But now when these people are being martyred, because those who give life for the sake of the Lord, they have been killed for the Lord. You know, uh, I don't know, I, I, I'm not uh, able to understand that. But are they going to be in a better position in the sense, uh, in the terms of reward? Because they are being killed, they, they, they are being killed. So that's what I'm wondering. All right. So, you know, what do we know about um, the rewards that um, 
uh, we're going to receive in heaven. Uh, we know that uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3 tells us that yeah, the work we do, right? So that's one basis on which, so it's not like just because somebody died for their faith, they will get a bigger reward. It's not just being martyred. It's about the work we do, right? First Corinthians 3, it says, talks about that. First Peter chapter 5, again, talks about uh, those who have served, you know, basically, Peter writes, he's writing to the elders of the church, and he's saying, you know, you, you have a reward. When the chief shepherd will appear, you will receive a crown of glory, which will not fade away. So that's another basis, you know, how, how, how you've served the church. A third basis we know from Matthew 25 is the faithfulness with which we serve. So um, I, we shouldn't assume that just because somebody was martyred, they will have a greater reward, because that's not the basis of rewards that we know of. One of them is, yes, the endurance. That's in Revelation 3. Now, he who endures to the end. Jesus says, you know, you've got to endure to the end, then you'll have. So endurance is one part of uh, you know, uh, the uh, the criteria or the basis. But there are other things like faithfulness, the works we did, have we done what God wants us to do, and also have we served the church, right? So these are the basis of the rewards. Um, uh, Daniel also says, you know, he who wins souls, so are you winning souls? That's also another basis of reward. So there will be people who are dying through the, throughout the tribulation. We will see them. Uh, we will see in chapter 7, 144,000 Jews are going to be preaching the gospel. They will also be taken up into heaven. They will also come up during the tribulation. And then in Revelation 20, the people who died during the tribulation will be raised up. So uh, so God will have a way in which he is going to give them their rewards. Uh, but the basis of the rewards we understand from various passages in Scripture is not exclusively whether you know you've been martyred. But it's uh, it's on several other things that the Lord gives us a reward. Okay, thank you so much, Pastor. Welcome. Say you you you, you have your hand raised. Yes, Pastor. Um, I'm just bringing this up just for benefit of everyone. How do you explain to some Christians who say there's nothing like rapture stated in Scripture, and then? They look at these events in the book of Revelation and tell us that these things are going to happen even while Christians are here. Mm. So, yeah, so we address this, and I'm sorry for referring us back to our second year course, but in our second year course on the end times, uh, we address this. We, first of all, we pointed out, and it's all in the notes there if you go back to your second year notes on the end times you'll find that the word rapture uh, is from it's found in the bible it's found in first thessalonians chapter 4 and it's it's the word from the latin scriptures so when somebody says the word rapture is not in the bible then we have to tell them it's a latin word of course it's not in the english bible but it is in the Latin Bible. So, you know, some of our English words actually have Latin roots. So, um, in First Th Thessalonians chapter 4 and uh, uh, verse 17, those who are alive and remain shall be caught up together. That word caught up together in Latin, and I've given it to you in the second year notes. It's the Latin word raptor from which we get the English word rapture. So you can tell them that, hey, it's in the Bible, it's in the Latin Bible, not in the English Bible. So when we use the English word rapture, we are using a biblical term, it's just that it comes from the Latin Bible based on 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 17. And in the same notes, in, in our second year notes on the end times, we gave six reasons why we state that there is a pre-tribulation rapture of the church six reasons uh, one significant reason is in second thessalonians chapter two uh you know and and you can review the notes we, we've elaborated the six reasons but one of the main reasons is in second thessalonians chapter two verse seven where uh, paul states now you know we explained how 
Paul's epistle to the Thessalonians, First Thessalonians and Second Thessalonians, are like a, a long letter. They come in two parts, but it's actually a long letter. That's a follow-up to the teaching is already given. Right. So, if you read First Thessalonians and Second Thessalonians as a as a long letter in two parts, there is a, a connecting thought running throughout, and he's referencing what he has already taught them while he was in person. And starting from First Thessalonians chapter one onwards, he he's saying he's talking about the coming of the Lord. So it's a it's a theme that runs through it. So he's talked about in chapter four he talks about the you know what be the rapture of the church in chapter five he says first Thessalonians chapter four rapture of the church first Thessalonians chapter five he's talking about the, the coming of the Lord as a thief in the night second Thessalonians chapter one he's continuing on where the Lord is coming and he's going to execute vengeance on those who don't you know obey the gospel then he goes into second Thessalonians chapter two where he begins to say okay let me tell you when this is going to happen and second Thessalonians two verse seven he says the, the the mystery of lawlessness is already at work, and I'm looking at it, 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 7. Just that there's something that's restraining this lawlessness from being manifested. And when he who restrains is taken out of the way, verse 8, then the lawless one will be revealed, referring to uh, the son of perdition, whom he has mentioned in 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 3. So 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 through 8, form you know, our, our primary basis to say, Paul has clearly stated there's only one thing left for the man of perdition to be revealed. And that when that one thing is taken out of the way, then the Antichrist will be revealed. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1 to 8. So then we discuss the question. This is in uh, our course on the end times. What is Paul referring to in Second Thessalonians 2, verse 7? only two options either the holy spirit or the church now when you study the scriptures the holy spirit is operating on the earth during the tribulation we will see right you know when we go to revelation chapter 7 there are 144000 jews who are sealed the seal in the new testament is the mark of the holy spirit uh, they are preaching the gospel so they have to preach empowered by the holy spirit people are being saved during the tribulation so you can only be saved with the help of the holy spirit there are two witnesses who are doing signs and wonders well you can only do signs and wonders uh, by the power of the holy spirit uh, so on you know so there is clear evidence that the holy spirit is still at work on the earth during the tribulation so if you exclude out the holy spirit then the only option you have is the church so Second Thessalonians 2 verse 7, we can state that he who restrains whom Paul is referring to is the church. And then we've given five other reasons why we believe that the church will be taken out of the way for uh, the tribulation, just before the tribulation. Yeah, is that okay? Okay. Um, good. Any other questions? It's like uh, Revelation chapter six. All right. Let's get go. Let's start off with verse twelve. Revelation six, verse twelve. Um, where uh, this is the sixth seal. Um, and in Revelation chapter six, twelve to seventeen. Could somebody read that? Okay. Thank you. Have a question? Go ahead, please. Thank you, sir. Um, just in Revelation chapter six, verse nine to, uh, to eleven, fifth seal. We see. Oh, okay. Uh, we see that the uh, souls of people who were murdered. Uh, under the uh, the throne of God, and it said that they were martyred for the for the gospel. And when they came crying to God, they were told that to wait till the the number of people be killed in the tribulation are completed. And it said earlier uh, on that those who, who who will be killed in that time they also be raised. So. 
uh, can you please help ex ex explain explain that such because here we see some are already in, in heaven sitting under the throne and th those will be killed uh, in, in that time they will be raised so how is that possible because if they are going already to heaven the soul that already in, in heaven resting in, under God's throne and some will be raised again uh, can you please help us mm. yeah good so this is exactly what's happening right now so from the time of Christ's resurrection the gospel is being preached and every person who has believed in Jesus who died after Christ so every believer who died physically after Christ what happens their bodies decay the bodies you know uh, decay here on earth but the moment they die exactly what happened what we read here in Revelation 6 9 to 11 happens to them that is their spirits go up into heaven so we have several New Testament scriptures to tell us that Philippians 1 Paul says um, for me to live is Christ to live is needful he tells the Philippians but it, it is far better for me to go and be with the Lord Philippians chapter 1 second Corinthians chapter 5 Paul says to be absent from this body is to be present with the Lord right? so what happens when a believer dies the body decays but the spirit and the soul, the eternal part of the soul, is going up into the very presence of God. Right? So right now, and Paul refers to this as the family of God in heaven. In Ephesians 3, he says, the Father, he references, references the Father, and he says, from whom the whole family in heaven and on earth. So part of God's family is on earth, that is you and me who are alive. Part of the family of God is in heaven. These are people who already died and the spirits are there, right? The spirit and soul, they've gone up to heaven. So when Christ comes, when the rapture happens, First Thessalonians chapter 4, uh, Paul describes, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Christ. So what you saying? God will bring with them what? Their spirit and soul. The God will bring with them, right? So when Christ comes, the trumpet is descending in the heavens, the spirit and soul is coming, and their bodies are raised. That means they receive glorified bodies. Now, of course, the bodies are disintegrated. God is not depending on the back, the physical body. It's all disintegrated. But God, at that instant, is going to give them glorified bodies. And he says, we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them. So that's the moment. Their spirit receives a glorified body. The glorified body is just like the body of Jesus. Right? So John says, First John 3, verse 1 to 3, he says, When we see him, we will be like him. Right? Philippians 3 he says, Our bodies will be raised up, and we will receive these bodies just like him, glorified bodies. So that's what happens at the, at the rapture. Then, we have lots of people dying during the tribulation. And we will see, like we see in Revelation 6, 9. We will see in Revelation 8. We will see in Revelation uh, 14 that these people show up in heaven. Their spirit and soul show up in heaven. Their bodies are here on earth, decaying, dead. They are showing up in heaven. And then, Revelation 20. The Battle of Armageddon, when Christ comes, after the Battle of Armageddon, John writes in Revelation 20, that these people will be raised up. So who are those people? Those who have died during the tribulation. They need to be raised up also. They'll be raised up. So every person, every saint of God, till that point will be alive, and they will, we will rule and reign with Christ during the tribulation. Uh, during the millennium, that's fulfillment of Daniel chapter 7. Is it okay, Maggie?
Oh, is it clear? Any further questions? Yes, I, it, it is clear. Thank you, sir. Okay, welcome. Okay, so Revelation 6, verse 12 onwards. Could somebody read that for us, please? 12 to 17. I watched as he opened the sixth seal. There was a great earthquake. The sun turned black like sackcloth made of goat hair. The whole moon turned blood red and stars in the sky fell to earth as figs drop from a fig tree when shaken by a strong wind. The heavens receded like a scroll being rolled up and every mountain and island was removed from, from its place. Then the kings of the earth, the princes, the generals, the rich, the mighty, and everyone else, both slave and free, hid in caves and among the rocks of the mountains. They called to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come, and who can withstand it? Mm, thank you. So the sixth seal is talking about um, great, both physical and cosmic events taking place. There is earthquake, uh, on the, a great earthquake, so much so that mountains and islands are being shaken. And you know you can we can imagine the consequences of that. Uh, we 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 observe today, uh, you know, the the impact of certain things that are happening, earthquakes, uh, other weather conditions that are very destructive. But this is in in a scale that has never been known before. So there's earthquakes, mountains, islands being shaken, and then there are cosmic events, events in the heavens above. And Joel prophesied in Joel chapter 2, right? the sun will be darkened, the moon will become blood red. There will be things happening in the heavens above before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Joel prophesied, Joel 2. And we see two instances in the book of Revelation, Revelation 6 and again in Revelation 8, when these kinds of events are recorded for us, cosmic events, you know, uh, sun being darkened, the moon being blood, red, and there are stars or meteors or you know heavenly bodies falling to the earth. Now, today, you know, we see, okay, there are meteors, sp meteors passing the earth. There are like 144,000 miles away from the earth. And they say, okay, that's the closest it's come, etc. You know, I think one passed by last last week or earlier this week, if you get, you know, but it's so many thousands of miles away from the earth. And they say, okay, that's the closest it's come and so on and so forth. But John is saying uh, there are going to be things that impact the earth. Right? So stars falling and so on. And it's going to be so, and it's not like something sporadic or one-off, but Verse 13 says it's like figs, fig tree dropping figs, meaning it's it's going to be numerous. Yeah, so it's uh, it's it's going to be catastrophic, and people are going to begin to cry. And Jesus, you know, mentioned this in Luke 23 when people cry out. He says, you know, just pray that you will not be around at this time. Yeah, you know, men are crying out, fall. They want to die because it's so so difficult during that time and they realize this is the great day of wrath so one thing we will notice as we read through uh, revelation is that people recognize what is happening revelation 6 verse 16 and 17 people are recognizing this is the day of god's wrath But it doesn't mean everybody is going to repent and turn to God. 
we see uh, later on in Revelation 13 that even though, sorry, uh, Revelation 14, I think it is, even though people are, are realize that, um, uh, Revelation 9, sorry, uh, Revelation 9, uh, even though people realize that what they are seeing is God's judgment, yet they do not repent. And that's a strange thing, and we'll see this again in Revelation 9, where people realize, you know, what is happening is the great day of God's wrath. This is judgment. This is what the Bible said will happen, and yet they do not repent. And that's the strange part that shows the degree of the hardness of men's hearts at this time, unwilling to repent, unwilling to turn to God, even though they realize, they know what we are seeing, what we're experiencing is actually the judgment of God, is actually what God has already spoken about. When we get into Revelation chapter 7, it's a very interesting chapter, and I'll just give a few comments and then we'll actually read it. Revelation 7, and again, we don't know why God has decided to do this, but it's very interesting. Revelation 7 tells us that there will be 144,000 Jewish people, servants, who've been sealed and marked by God specifically for this time in the tribulation. So their work starts in the early part of the tribulation. And they are going to be servants of God. And they are chosen out of the 12 tribes. Now this doesn't mean that they will all be living in Israel. The Bible doesn't state that. So we need to think about these as Jewish people scattered around the world. There are going to be 144,000 Jewish people who are going to serve God during the tribulation. And in Revelation chapter 7, you can divide this chapter into two parts. Uh, the first part is an introduction and, an, uh, and a narration about these 144,000 Jewish people who are being marked by God to serve God. And then the second part is about the result of them serving. Uh, there will be, there's a record of many people in heaven. And John says, you know, where did all these people come from? And then one of the elders tell him, these are the people. They've come out of this tribulation. That means they were killed during the tribulation. They have their uh, uh, robes dipped in blood. They, you know, so it shows us a picture of so many people who have been saved, who have being killed during the tribulation, and they're in the appearing in the presence of God. So another, you know, uh, indication that so many people will be saved during the tribulation. They'll be killed. They'll be martyred for their faith, and they're coming. Their spirit and soul is coming up in the presence of God, and that's the second half of Revelation seven. Now, about these hundred forty-four thousand Jews, we read about them again in Revelation fourteen. So. We'll have to wait till chapter 14 to see what happens to them. In Revelation 14, which is on the other side of the middle of the tribulation, Revelation 11 marks the middle of the tribulation. On the other side of this, in Revelation 14, we see these 144,000 Jews up in heaven, which means something has happened, and we will discuss it when we get to chapter 14. They are no longer on the earth. Either they've all been killed, or they've all been raptured. They're taken up into heaven, and we see them up in heaven, and they, you know, they're commended for the way they served God during the tribulation here on earth. So it means they start off in the early part of the tribulation, and somewhere after the middle of the tribulation, Revelation 14, they are all up in heaven. Right? We'll discuss it there when we get to 40, chapter 14. What is the probable cause of, you know, how did they actually get to heaven? But as a point, just a side note, and this is not very important, but it's a side note that uh, there are 144,000 Jews, which means there are 12 tribes, which means there should be 12,000 from each tribe. 
But as we read through chapter 7, we will find that two tribes have been left out. Dan and Ephraim, the two tribes, have been, they're not mentioned here. But in their place, there are other two, there is other two tribes, Levi and uh, Manasseh are mentioned. And again, you know, th there is no reason stated for it. So, uh, you know, Bible scholars will say, okay, maybe, again, this is just a logical uh, thought, that maybe Dan and Ephraim were left out because of their going off into idolatry, and they were replaced by um, Levi and Manasseh. That's it. You know, it's, there's no reason given. But it doesn't mean God has got rid of these tribes, because when we go to Ezekiel, the 48th chapter, which talks about the millennial temple, which is after the tribulation, during the 1,000-year reign of Christ, there is the millennial temple that Ezekiel writes about in chapters 44 to 48. Uh, so in there, in Ezekiel 48, you see that these tribes of um, Dan and Ephraim are there. So God hasn't totally disregarded them. They are going to be there uh, as part of the 12 tribes. But for whatever reason, which is not stated, they are not mentioned in Revelation chapter 7. It's just a side note. We don't know the actual reason. We can make a logical guess, uh, but we don't, you know, we don't know for sure. Okay, so with that introduction, let's go to Revelation 7, three verses each, please. Let's read and feel free to ask your questions once we finish reading. We'll start with verse 1. Uh, you can read three verses each. After this, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth to prevent any wind from blowing on the land or on the sea or on any tree. Then I saw another angel coming up from the east, having the seal of the living God. He called out in a loud voice to the four angels who had been given power to harm the land and the sea. Do not harm the land or the sea or the trees until we put a seal on the foreheads of the servants of our God. It was for somebody? Thank you. Verse 4. And he reads, Then I heard the number of those who were sealed, 444,000, from all the tribes of Israel. From the tribe of Judah, 12,000 were sealed. From the tribe of Reuben, 12,000. From the tribe of God, 12,000. From the tribe of Asher, 12,000. From the tribe of Naphtali, 12,000. From the tribe of Manasseh, 12,000. From the tribe of Simon, 12,000. From the tribe of Levi, 12,000. From the tribe of Issachar, 12,000. From the tribe of Zebulon, 12,000. From the tribe of Joseph, 12,000. From the tribe of Benjamin, 12,000. Thank you. Verse 9 onwards, please, somebody. After these things, I looked and behold a great multitude which no one could count from every nation and all tribes and peoples and tongues standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes and palm were in their hands. And they cry out with a loud voice saying, Salvation to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshipped God. Thank you. Verse 12, you go. Saying, Amen. Saying, Amen. Blessing and, all, blessing and glory and wisdom. Thanksgiving and honor and power and might. Be to our, 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 our be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders answered, saying to him, Who are these arrayed 
in white jobs and where did they come from? Okay, thank you. Was 14 to 17 somebody, please? And I said to him, sir, you know. So he said to me, these are the one who come out of the great tribulation and washed their robe and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sit on the throne will dwell among them. They shall neither hunger any more nor thirst any more. The sun shall not strike them nor any heat. For the Lamb who is in the midst of the throne will shepherd them and lead them to living fountain of waters. And God will weep away every tear from their eyes. Mm. Amen. Thank you. So, uh, let's just point out a few things. And Abraham, I see a question uh, in the chat. We will come to that, right? We just will come to that. So, uh, Revelation 7. John is saying now, he's seeing four angels. And they're holding back the four winds of the earth. Now, you remember in the book of Daniel, I think it was um, Daniel 7, also we read about the four winds. So uh, uh, we mentioned at that time that it represents uh, this, this, this phrase, the four winds is typically used to show some movement of God or some work of God, something that God wants done. But at this time, he's saying, don't blow, okay? So in other words, kind of pause, wait, because I need to get something else done. So the four winds are being held back. Uh, it's it's a prophetic message, prophetic actor. So don't think literally, you know, uh, don't think that uh, this is physical in the sense, okay, there's no, the wind will not blow on the earth. No, it's a prophetic picture when it talks about the four winds uh, we have them used different places in the Bible in the New Test Old and New Testament but talking about when the four winds it means a four corners of the earth coming in it's showing a movement of God something God wants done but in Revelation 7 1 he says angels hold them back meaning wait there's something that needs to be done and what needs to be done he says we need to seal these 144,000 Jews, put a mark. So he says, verse 2, the seal of the living God. So we wonder, like, you know, what is the seal of the living God? In the New Testament, the seal of the living God is used in two ways. One, it's used uh, to indicate the presence of the Holy Spirit. We see this for the believer in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, in Ephesians chapter Three and also in verse uh, chapter four, you know, we he says, "Do not grieve the Holy Spirit, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption." Ephesians four verse thirty. Right. So, the Holy Spirit is the seal. One. Second, the name of God put upon our lives is also a seal in the New Testament. So, when he refers to the seal of the living God. It, it's referring to, as far as the New Testament context, the New Testament context, the seal of God, or seal of the living God is, one, the presence of the Holy Spirit, from Ephesians 1, Ephesians 4, 2 Corinthians 1. And it also represents the name of God written upon us. We see this both in Revelation 3, also in the latter part, in Revelation 22, uh, says, I'll put my name upon their foreheads, seal. So that's what it says, right? So we are not talking about some mark like 666. No, it's the presence of the Holy Spirit. So this is one reason that we can say, hey, the Holy Spirit is going to, one of the many reasons we see in the New Testament, in the book of Revelation, the Holy Spirit is going to be active on the earth during the tribulation. Because the seal of the living God is a term that's used to talk about the Holy Spirit. 
the work of the Holy Spirit in the life of a believer. So 144,000 people, Jewish, Jews, are given the seal of the living God. So like I said earlier, they could be scattered all over the earth. They, they're not all necessarily to be localized in Jerusalem or Israel. They're 144,000 Jews. They are descendants of these various tribes. And the Holy, uh, and these angels have said, okay, these people have the seal of God. And in this passage, it's not telling us that other than the verse, the verse 3, other than using the term, the servants of our God, this passage is not telling us, hey, why are you doing this? What is the point of having these 144,000 Jews see, having the seal of God? There's no other information. But the phrase, verse 3, the servants of our God is significant. It means these 144,000 Jews have been specially marked, anointed by God to serve Him during the tribulation. That's something to think about. Jewish people going to serve the living God during the tribulation. They are marked with the Holy Spirit. So the same people who rejected, and I mean, I'm not saying the same people, but the people in the sense of individuals, but I'm talking about the, the, the nation that rejected Jesus Christ are going to be proclaiming Christ during the tribulation. The impact or the effect of their work is seen right there in verses 9 through 17 because the next thing John is seeing is he's seeing great multitude of people standing before the throne of God. He can't, it says, I can't even number them. And they are from all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues. And this is, this is the verse from which we get the name All People's Church. Right? Yeah, this, is, this is kind of what inspired the name because he says, I see people of all, I, I see a great multitude of all peoples. So he said, okay, that's nice, all peoples church, yeah. So he's saying, I see all this great multitude. And they're standing with the throne of God, they're worshipping God, there are angels around them, and they're worshipping. And then one of the elders asks him, hey, do you know who these people are? John says, oh, you know. And the elder says, these people, this great multitude of people you're seeing, they've come out of this tribulation. It means they are people who they're before the throne of God, and it, you can you can see from you can infer from what he says, they will hunger and thirst no more, and they have washed their robes, or their robes uh, in the blood of the Lamb. So. They've come out of this tribulation. That means they were in it, martyred or killed during the tribulation, and their soul, spirit and soul, are in the presence of God, worshipping God. And God is saying, they will not suffer anymore. So, they, verse 16, they won't hunger and thirst. They're not going through They're not going to go through it. So, it's parallel to Revela uh, chapter 6, 9 to 11. Here's another instance. And you, we will see some of these repeated. There's another instance where, you, where we can see people who have been killed during the tribulation standing before the throne of God, worshipping God. They've come out of this great tribulation. So, this is one reason we can say that these 144,000 Jews, they're servants of God, obviously they're serving God, empowered by the Holy Spirit. And what we are seeing next is a result of their work, which is people who've been saved, who have given their lives to Christ, but during the tribulation, they're going up into heaven. They're coming before the throne of God, worshipping God. There's, a, there's no more information about these 144,000 Jews until we come to 
chapter 14. So we wait till then to get a little bit more understanding on what they do or how they live their life on earth during the tribulation, right? So we wait till then. Um, we will take a break. Um, yeah, so uh, let's take a quick break. Then after we come from the break, uh, we will take up these questions. Abraham, I see your question. And say uh, also note, note that you raise your hands. So we'll take up your question as well. And any other questions on chapter seven, we will discuss right after our break, All right? So we'll see you in 10 minutes and we will discuss further. Thank you. <laughs> 